Hi guys, so let's discuss some more questions about ADC exam part one. Uh, according to this week's schedule, mark three is to be solved by all my enrolled candidates and to just track their progress. Uh, currently we have like 18 marks, 19th one I'm preparing. Uh, so these are just two sample questions from mock three that I would like you to see how to solve them. All the other candidates are free to watch this video too uh, in order to understand how you're supposed to approach the ADC questions. Many other such SBQs I've posted on my channel. So let's start. So question number one, a 55 year old female presents at your surgery complaining of extremely sharp oral pain of a few seconds duration. It arises whenever she touches an area of skin above the right hand side of her upper lip adjacent to the angle of mouth. The patient is fit and well and is not taking any medication. Now they have provided us with a picture. Now on the upper right side, uh, you don't see anything that might have given a problem. It can be something inside, but then for that you have to take an OPG. But given a history, the keywords here are sharp pain for a few seconds duration. Second keyword is whenever she touches an area of skin. So this touching an area over the skin, triggering a sharp pain, lasting for a few duration is classical sign of trigeminal neuralgia. Even before I move to the options, a kind of probable diagnosis is in my head. But let's see what the question asks. So this is the main scenario. We'll go ahead and see the options. You found out that the patient is dentally fit. Okay, so probably we have done all the investigations. What could the provisional diagnosis be? Migraine, atypical facial pain, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, TN, and post herpetic neuralgia. Well, I'm bound to go with trigeminal neuralgia. Um, if I would be having a differential diagnosis, probably I would go with atypical facial pain. But because the question specifically mentions uh, the pain arising after touching a triggered area, I would go with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia won't be manifested just on one side of the face, okay? It can be in the throat, it can be somewhere else, and definitely all the other options don't have a trigger zone. But trigeminal neuralgia has a trigger zone and the question mentions it. So my answer, probable answer would be trigeminal neuralgia. What is the most common cause of this condition in this patient age? Now, what is the patient age? It's 55. Now, if it was post-herpetic neuralgia, then I would have probably thought of going with viral infection. Acute fungal infection, streptococcal, multiple sclerosis, and vascular pressure. Now, out of all these options, uh, since we don't have any dental issue, and since the patient is 55, it is a very common age for people to have this problem. And that happens due to vascular pressure. So the nerve is getting compressed because of some or the other reason, which is the most probable cause. Actually, the exact cause of trigeminal neuralgia is yet not known. It is multiple factors, but the most common factor is vascular pressure. Now see, uh, to all those candidates who are solving this mock, I would suggest when you see such a question, I would like you to go back to your basic textbook or just open a PPT over Google, you know, regarding trigeminal neuralgia. Read about it. Make your own notes. It's no point if you just solve this question and move ahead. You should know the concept and the basics about this. And the fact that this question has been asked in the exam means more of such questions can be asked in the exam. So when you're reading about trigeminal nerve, I, I suggest you also read about all these options also. So open about atypical facial pain, glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Read theory about it. Take enough time. Take like 45 minutes to go through all these conditions and then move on to further questions. So in that way, if you study, you are covering a lot of lateral topics as well, which can be asked in ADC. Now coming to what is the most common drug of choice for treating this diagnosed condition? So all of us have studied in our third year videos that Tegretol or Carbamazepine is the drug of choice. Now in this option, we have been given with Brufane, no, which is an NSAID. Phenytoin, no. Gabapentin, no, it's a barbiturate. 
oxycarbamazepine. Uh, now, if they would have just have given carbamazepine, then I would have chosen that. But uh, since they have given oxcarbamazepine, no, I won't choose that. Tegretol is a brand name for carbamazepine. So I'm going to go with that answer. Now, when pain affects all three divisions of trisomandal nerve and often bilateral is known as. Now, a classic trigeminal neuralgia is unilateral. Glossopharyngeal neuralgia will not affect the divisions of trigeminal nerve because it's a different nerve altogether. It's the ninth nerve, while trigeminal is the fifth nerve, right? Trigeminal neuralgia non-classic becomes the answer of choice. Post-herpetic neuralgia is a different thing altogether. My suggestion is read between classic trigeminal neuralgia, non-classic trigeminal neuralgia, and post-herpetic neuralgia. You will understand the differences. And once you understand that, this question becomes more easier to solve and the answer becomes C. Now, if the patient was in her 30s, so they have changed the age and complained of a similar pain, what would be the likely cause? Now, they have this, this keyword complained of similar pain is very important because when they said similar pain, you have to understand how is the pain? Pain is of a sharp duration. How long does it last? Few seconds and it's triggered while touching an area over her face. These three are the components of pain. So a similar pain means again a trigeminal neuralgia like pain but at the age of 30 instead of 55 then what could be the condition? So don't get confused with the other options like cluster headache, atypical facial pain, paroxysmal hemicrania. You may get confused between the option of multiple sclerosis and none of the above. So it can happen that you don't know the answer to this. So read about multiple sclerosis and cluster headache and atypical facial pain like I said. Now in multiple sclerosis, one of the feature is a pain like trigeminal neuralgia. So since they have given that option, I'm bound to choose that. If they would have not given this option and something else, I probably would have gone with none of the above. So my answer here would be multiple sclerosis. So again, read about all these things before you move on to the next SBQ. Pause this video. Go ahead. Read about all these things. Then come back and watch the second question. Understood? This is how you study for ADC by keeping it interesting. Now, a 60-year-old female, this is another SBQ, I'm solving the second one for you. A 60-year-old female presents, uh, attends your surgery complaining of soreness affecting her gingiva, okay. She has no accompanying skin lesions, uh, this is a key word, no accompanying skin lesions, okay. Other mucosal surface do not appear to be affected, that means cheek, is no lips, etc. is not affected. She is medically fit, again a key word and is not taking any medication. On internal examination, DG has been observed, that is desquamitative gingivitis. Your differential diagnosis is between lichen planus and mucous membrane pancreatic. Now you decide to carry out an incisional biopsy and send it to the lab. So the question has given that you have kind of done the examination, you have formed your probable diagnosis, and now you're confused between two because your treatment would depend on what is diagnosed because they all exhibit the same symptoms, right? So since the patient is medically fit and etc., you are confused between lichen planus and mucous membrane pamphicoid. So now you have done the biopsy. Let's see what are the questions now. What solution would you use to put the specimen in while sending to the lab? We all know that any specimen that needs to be fixed in its existing state is always put in formalin. So I won't go with saline or glutaraldehyde or hydrogen peroxide. I would directly go with formalin. Now here, just remember it's 10 percent formalin. And in, in your exam, if they give different percentages of formalin, so you have to remember it's always 10 percent formalin. You remember that stringy smell? My God, it, it it used to burn my eyes and nose in first year when we used to go for cadaver dissections. Yeah, that formalin. <laughs> All right, so what procedure performed on sections of fresh frozen tissue do you expect the histopathology department will perform in addition to the conventional staining with hematoxylin and eosin, that's H&E stains. 
so what the question is asking basically is the the tissue that you have just sent to them they are going to stain it with h and e you remember those expensive pencils of h and e yeah those those <laughs> stains <laughs> so uh, they are going to stain and observe that in the microscope now apart from this what is the other thing that they will also be doing now see lichen planus and uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid spe specifically the mucous membrane pemphigoid now if i want to detect whether if that is the problem or not um uh, it do you know the histology of the lesion of pemphigoid it's it's because of the auto it's an autoimmune disease right the body's own antibodies go and they clump and they form those component and get deposited in the basal layer which separates the superficial skin from the below skin and that's how the skin starts to peel off it forms bullying you know vesicular bullous diseases they are called as so when you see that indirect immunofluorescence uh, you will immediately see if it's due to the antigen antibody reaction or it's something else so uh, always all the autoimmune diseases are seen under direct immunofluorescence and that's why in order to rule out whether it's lichen planus or not a uh, direct immunofluorescence would give a better idea like, apart from the h and e stain so that would be my answer but what you should do is you should read about all these tests in direct immunofluorescence direct immunofluorescence pap staining pas staining and immunoperoxidized staining because there are some lesions in which the other things would be used so you should know what these tests are for and for what diseases they are used then you will be more confident in answering questions if it's asked on the subject again now which medication group is used to treat most conditions associated with these comorbidities gingivitis now here in this third sbq they have moved on from uh, lichen planus and pemphigoid they have asked a general question with regards to these comorbidities gingivitis each sbq take it as a fresh perspective don't don't link in your brain as if it's going to be related to the previous sbq you understand it might be just different they are it may be just a basic mcq of dental question and not related to the scenario so i would suggest that this sbq is like a direct mcq question irrespective of the scenario so here uh, mostly all the immuno or rather said the autoimmune diseases are treated with steroids they are not bacterial or viral or malarial or anything else so my answer would be steroids corticosteroids open corticosteroids from therapeutic guidelines and we Uh, now, if the condition is mucous membrane pemphigoid, what is a special clinical consideration or concern for this patient? Now, suppose if you if you got the result from the lab saying it's pemphigoid, so what would you be immediately concerned about? So, we treat the patient holistically, as in we are bothered about the general health as well. So, if suppose we find something in the mouth, example. Uh, uh leukemia like of a lesion and there is a carious tooth apart from treating the tooth we will inform the patient that you know what uh, go to your gp and get examined because we think some other parts of your body might also be affected same way when when this question is asked it means in general uh, what would be your concern like what this disease can affect any other part of the body which the patient might not aware of is not planning to visit the gp but you are supposed to tell him to go and visit so that timely treatment can prevent those damaging conditions so pemphigoid affects eyes okay so i want you to read uh, pemphigoid very nicely it can cause scarring or uh, calcifications in the cornea leading to permanent blindness sometimes so timely active treatment is going to prevent that so let's see what the options are high malignant transformation no pemphigoid doesn't have a malignant potential attention to possible eye infection yes easy mucosal peeling due to fragile bullae but that's a part of the disease and probably that's the reason the patient came to you intact bullae rarely seen in this condition that's true but is that a concern no that's a symptom 
multiple pigmentations involving oral tissues may or may not be present but again it's not a special concern the special concern here would be either point a or point b and since i have not read so far any perfigoid lesions having high malignant potential i am bound to choose option b it's actually very easy to choose if you understand what the question is asking now, most cases of oral lichen planus are. So, you see, they have again switched. Um, it's no longer related to pamphigoid. It's again a basic MCQ dental question. Most cases of oral lichen planus are trauma, no, genetic, question mark, if I'm not sure, alcohol linked, not necessarily, smoking linked, mm, you can say so, but idiopathic, yes, because they have asked about most cases. And most cases are idiopathic. Uh, you just don't know the cause. They just happen. There are risk factors. Yes. Can smoking and alcohol be a risk factor? Yes. But are you sure they are the cause of it? No. So I'm going to go with idiopathic. So this is how you're going to solve your ABC questions. I hope this was helpful. I'll release more videos on how to solve as and when I can. And Best of luck for your mark three. Bye-bye.